Um, my name is, uh, is Reg Bailey and I'm the Chief Executive of the, uh, of the Mothers' Union. And um, uh, you might think, why is a man involved with the Mothers' Union? Uh, but to be a member of Mothers' Union, you don't need to be a man or indeed a mother. Uh, we are really an organisation that was um, set up to uh, really to, to, to be dedicated to uh, making the world a better place for families. And uh, we have some 4 million members uh, around the world um, in 83 different countries. And we are um, passionate about promoting a society that values and protects children. And um, we do that by promoting uh, stable relationships through marriage, uh, family life, and the protection of, of children in order to, trans uh, to transform communities. Um, it shouldn't therefore surprise you that, the, that therefore we got involved a few years ago in a campaign to look at the commercial and sexualized aspect of childhood. We call it bye-bye childhood, which I'm, I'm not sure works in, in Polish, it certainly works in English. Bye-bye meaning farewell and bye-bye meaning hand over money. Um, and because we did so, because the world uh, that uh, affects children in the UK and elsewhere in Europe is, um, is both commercialized and sexualized. Uh, commercialized in the sense that um, parents uh, are faced with effectively a tidal wave of money that is spent on promoting things aimed at children. In the UK, that market is worth some 99 billion pounds a year um, in the UK, left of the UK and Ireland. And it affects um, values and aspirations and the health of children. Um, in many senses, we're aware of the advertising that, um, that, that just now Elaine spoke about, the, the broadcast advertising, uh, advertising on television, in the press, in the public space, uh, and, and so on. But what we're less aware of is, um, is non-broadcast media. Uh, this time globally, uh, this time last year globally, the world changed from more money being spent in broadcast media to not more money being spent in non-broadcast media through the medium of the internet. And that has uh, just the same sort of effects uh, that we would expect uh, when uh, marketing is unsupervised uh, as far as children are concerned. And in particular, one of the things that parents were beginning to tell us was that they were concerned about public space, that public space was no longer family friendly, but heavily um, commercialised, aimed at children and at adults alike. And also that it was sexualised. Um, children being bombarded with images of, of how they should look and uh, things that they should own. And actually, as Elaine has said very articulately, um, it leads to uh, stress, to anxiety, and lower self-esteem. In some of the interviews that we did with children before uh, the main part of our report started, we, we noticed that particularly with girls, uh, their aspirations of what they could be and what they could do were rapidly changing and going down again. Um, uh, my mother, who was born in 1910, uh, left school at the age of 12 and was told she didn't need education because actually as soon as she was old enough uh, she would marry, have a family and then she would dedicate her life to bringing up her children and looking after her husband. Uh, my generation, um, girls were told, no, you can move forward in life. You can do certain jobs like teach or nurse. My own daughter, who is in her mid-thirties, was told, the sky is the limit. You're exactly the same as boys. The opportunities will be open to you. You can do what you wish. One would hope that that would continue. But in many children we've spoken to, affected by some of the imagery that we've uh, seen uh, during this morning, you have people who say, what do you want to be when you're older? And the number of them who say, I'd like to be famous. What do you want to be famous for? Do you want to be famous for inventing the new, the next form of radiation therapy, cancer treatment or whatever? No, I just want to be famous. Or I want to be a footballer's wife or a footballer's girlfriend. The aspirations 
falling in again. And I think Elaine explained much of that this morning. So when we've seen that, it wasn't that surprising that we developed that um, Bye Bye Childhood campaign. And what we found from that was that more than eight out of 10, 10 parents that we spoke to, well over that, said they were concerned about the sexualized content in media seen all over the place uh, by our children. And we decided, it, it, much in the same sense as your cause does, to take some political action. And in the first instance, we decided to run an e-petition, uh, which we would then take to uh, Downing Street, the headquarters of the government. And over 18,500 people signed that petition in just over a week. And we were able to go and present that to uh, our Prime Minister, David Cameron. Following on from that, um, David Cameron uh, uh, approached me and asked if I would uh, work, having worked on this Bye Bye Childhood campaign, would I carry out this independent review? Independent from government, independent from political interference. Now, there have been a number of reviews that have been carried out in the previous few years done by very eminent academics. And I'm certainly not an eminent academic. But what he wanted was two things. Firstly, he said, I would like a values-based review. A review that values children for who they are rather than for what they look like or what they own. And the second thing I would like is a review that comes up with some common sense, practical proposals that we can enact. Because actually what we've been doing with our review is talking to industry, to parents and to parliamentarians alike. During the course of that review, I interviewed just over 1,000 parents correctly adjusted for dem demographics, for age, social class, geography, and age of the children and of the parents. I also spoke to around 600 children and young people aged between 8 and 17. I spoke to something like 100 different companies and regulators. Those companies ranging from people like Facebook, uh, social media networking sites and so on, through internet service providers, to people who are involved in the media industry, clothing manufacturers and retailers, and the regulators. And what I'm, I'm going to briefly touch on what sort of emerged from that, the main <coughs> themes, what my recommendations were, and to try and encourage you and not leave you depressed from this presentation, to show you that actually you can make progress in a relatively short period of time. So the first thing I wanted to touch on uh, was the wallpaper of children's lives. Sexualized imagery is so prevalent in the public space in the UK that it becomes like wallpaper. We no longer notice it. We no longer actually see what it's doing, but it does influence children. Elaine very, again, very articulately outlined exactly what some of those issues were. And even when we cannot prove it, common sense tells you that if you listen to a thousand parents, and most of them, nine out of 10 of them, tell you that that's some of the things they're worried about, then actually we need to take notice of it. So that wallpaper of children's lives was a crucial thing. The second thing that parents told us that they were really concerned about was clothing and products and services aimed at children. Um, this is a, a, a baby grow. It's a naught to six month old, uh, for, for a child a, between naught and six months, and across the front there is, um, I'm a boob man. Um, that was very, very prevalent. That sort of um, heavily sexualized uh, activity, that, that, uh, uh, um, slogans on clothing. <coughs> we also encountered um, products mainstream stores were selling, uh, such as a pajama, a pajama set for 10-year-old girls, uh, which comprised, for example, a, a little set of gingham uh, trousers, perfectly all right, an orange t-shirt top. So far, so good. But printed across the front said, future porn star, um, which is very concerning. And many, uh, you, you have to wonder at two things. One, why is a store selling that? And secondly, why are adults buying it? And that's a crucial thing that we need to think of. The third area that was expressed to us was a concern about children as consumers. I said that more than half of a marketing expenditure is, um, is in the non-broadcast media, so people are unaware of how that works. 
Online behavioural advertising is a key element in uh, how companies like social networking sites make money. Uh, they watch the keywords that people are using when they post on their wall and, uh, and then that is turned back into marketing aimed at children. Um, and often aimed at adults but reaching children because age verification on social networking sites is virtually non-existent. The fourth theme that emerged from this was the number of parents who felt that they were a lone voice in the wilderness. The pressure of sexualized activity around them is such that many parents feel that they're the only one who feels the unease, that they're the only one who is concerned about what they're seeing. And that really starts to concern parents because they feel that there is nowhere to go and it's not easy to complain and have your voices heard. So those are the four themes, and what approaches did we encounter from people? Well, the first was this, that um, the world is a nasty place. We can't do anything about it, but we need to somehow protect our children from it. We need to, as I would say in English, wrap our children in cotton wool. And somehow at the age of 18, we could remove the cotton wool and let them loose in the world, as though they were able to cope with it. And the other aspect we came across was people who said, oh, you don't need to worry. Yes, it is a nasty world. You don't need to protect children. All you need to do is give them media literacy training. Kids are media savvy. Well, I have to tell you of the 600 children I interviewed, some of them certainly were media savvy. But many, many children did not know how to cope. I told uh, a story yesterday to uh, an interviewer who, who asked the question about why do you think that media literacy doesn't always work? And it's partly because actually we can, underst we can understand the mechanisms, but we, can, we underrate at our peril the fact that the influence it may have on us. A 15-year-old girl I spoke to was telling me about media literacy in her school. And she said, oh yes, we do media literacy, I know that, I understand all that. She said, let me tell you, I also study biology. And I know that if I'm in um, bare feet and I'm dancing around in the sitting room and I tread on a pin, a signal goes up my nervous system to my brain to tell me that I've trodden on it. And another system goes down another part of my sympathetic, my parasympathetic nervous system and contracts the muscles in the back of my calf and I take my foot off. That's, that's what biology teaches me. But it does not stop it hurting my foot. It doesn't stop it hurting me. And media literacy is like that. They show us a photograph in a magazine of an impossibly thin girl and glamorous looking girl advertising a perfume. And I know that in reality she's possibly a size 10 and they photoshopped her down to a, a size zero. And then she said, I know she has spots just like I do. But actually they photoshop and airbrush the spots out to give her a flawless complexion. That's media literacy. I understand that's what they do. But it doesn't stop it hurting me. It doesn't stop it hurting me. And actually, that's exactly the point about some of these issues. Do we carry on and allow an, a, a, an unthinking drift into an ever more sexualized uh, society that we live in? Or do we try and reverse that trend and also give our children the emotional resilience to withstand it? And so, uh, I think we need to accept, first of all, that those issues raised by the commercialization and the sexualization of childhood have their roots in our adult culture. We need to look very closely at the society which we have created. And then secondly, we do need to put the brakes on that unthinking drift and help children understand uh, and resist the potential harms that they face. And if we really want children to be children, then we need parents to be parents. And parents need help. They panic, really. Um, and they need help from all of us. And that meant that we needed to talk to three groups of people. We needed not just to talk to parents and children, but we needed to talk to businesses and to broadcasters and the regulators and say that you have a role to play in this. And if we want our parents to be involved, then we need to make it sexually, uh, socially com uh, acceptable to complain about what we see. This is a clip from, or just a, it's a still,
from um, a programme uh, called The X Factor, which is a major programme on British television. Average viewing for X Factor on a Saturday evening, which is shown at around 7 o'clock in the evening, is about 8 million people, which means there are about 2.5 million children watching it. And uh, there were two acts in the X Factor final of December 2011, Christina Aguilera um, and uh, Rihanna. Uh, Rihanna's lyrics are effectively urban music lyrics, very, very sexually explicit. And Christina Aguilera did effectively um, a, 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 a burlesque type of routine, which normally would have been shown on British television at least after nine o'clock, after what we call the watershed but it was shown on television. About 3,000 parents complained that they were not expecting to see that and they didn't want to see it. But many, many parents did not complain because they felt uh, that they were being prudish, that they would be seen as prudish. So we need to make it socially acceptable. And if we want children to be children, then we need parents to be parents, which means we have to accept our own ambivalence. Do we set, for example, parental controls on internet-enabled devices? Do we use the filtering systems that are out there? And I know that they appreciate from talking to parents, they're not easy to put on, but do we make use of them? At the moment, the figure is in the UK, about 56% of parents uh, put on their parental controls. And I checked in Poland, it's just 22% of parents who set parental controls, as at the end of last year. I'm sure it's gonna be higher after today. Um, do we uh, have, and we, we encountered many, many parents who bought an 18 rated video game and played it with an 11 year old son on the grounds that it helped them bond with their children. Now the three best selling 18 rated video games in the UK is Mortal Kombat Call of Duty, which is an extremely violent shoot 'em up game, um, Grand Theft Auto, where you gain points for knocking women down in the street, particularly street workers and prostitutes. And this is a clip from, or a, a shot from Catherine, which is a sexual avatar. An 18 rated game, which will perform all sorts of sexual activities uh, when programmed to do so. Not exactly three of the ways that I would think most dads would want to bond with their 11 year old uh, children. And indeed, if you, don't, if you think that's extreme, then one has to look at even our own attitudes towards fashion and what it means for us as adults. Is it that surprising that in Elaine's study of, of um, the women in, of the girls in Fiji, that once they started being uh, exposed to Western television, they did notice significant numbers of eating disorders emerging? So. Um, this was the sort of backcloth at which we were working, and so we made a number, as, as our Prime Minister had asked me to do, he said, would you make some practical, common sense suggestions? And so the first thing we said was, well, what we'd like to see is that sexualised imagery in the public space um, uh, should, should be um, things like the internet, uh, television, music videos, magazines, newspapers, are much more in line with what parents would find acceptable. So public space becomes more friendly. Most of the regulation that surrounds marketing and advertising in the UK is referred to a panel of the general viewing public. And uh, we felt that over a period of time, the general public's acceptance of what, were, what was out there was becoming to be at variance with that that parents would expect. We interviewed numerous couples who said, well, if I'd have seen that when there were the, just the two of us, I wouldn't have worried about it. And then the crucial phrase comes in, but now we have children, I don't want to see it. That attitude starts to change, and so a lot of my recommendations were around changing the basis of the panel that decides what's acceptable in the public space. And so I made a series of recommendations that magazines and newspapers with sexualized imagery on their front covers were not in easy sight of children. Uh, magazines like these, which are soft porn magazines effectively, are not displayed as pornography is in the UK on the top shelves, but they're actually, the recommended display level was one to 1.2 meters above floor height and next to puzzle books and children's comics. 
and many parents told, they, oh, told us they found that unacceptable. To reduce the amount of on-street advertising containing sexualized imagery in places where children are likely to see it. This is actually taken from a bus side in, of a London bus uh, in, in, um, running along the side of the, of, the, of the bus. To ensure that the content of pre-watershed television meets parents' expectations. To introduce age ratings for music videos. There are no age ratings for music videos at all, so any child can accept them. And as you heard Elaine saying this morning, music videos have an enormous impact on children. Many, many parents that we spoke to said they were concerned about the attitude of their sons to their sisters and female friends of the family when they'd been watching urban rap music videos. And, um, and then there's a, there's a very large group of young lads between the ages of 15 and 17 that are profoundly affected by heavy metal music. And uh, many of those uh, music videos would be rated uh, 18 or R or be refused the certificate if they were shown in the cinema. We wanted to make it easier for parents to block adult and age-restricted material from the internet. Uh, as I said before, parental controls are not used by that many, but also they're not that easy to put on. And you cannot, you, or, or rather you can easily avoid making a choice. <laughs> and actually what I was recommending was that a, an active choice be forced on you as you set up a computer or as you set up an internet-enabled device, so that you cannot avoid having a conversation with your children and young people about the dangers uh, that they might encounter on the internet. What we also wanted to see was that retailers would not, um, would not be able to uh, sell or market products that were inappropriate for children. Many, many parents told us they were really concerned about uh, the sort of products that were being sold to children. I, I touched on a few of them, but a far greater concern to the majority of parents was the continuing reduction in size of adult aimed uh, clothing aimed at adults and reduced down in size for children. Uh, and, and I'll touch on where we've got to with that in a moment. Um, and that the regulations protecting children from excessive uh, pressures are comprehensive and effective across all media and in line with parental expectation. So I put um, there's seven uh, reactions to that. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of those, but some of them relate to, for example, banning children under the age of 16 from things like brand, um, brand ambassadors and peer-to-peer -peer advertising, where often the first time that a parent knows that their child has been recruited uh, is when a new pair, for example, of trainers turn up because the child has been deliberately asked to befriend other children online with all the risks that that entails. Um, and then also that parents would find it easier to voice their concerns uh, and that they're heard when they do voice those concerns. So what I wanted was a single web portal uh, that parents could go to. So it didn't matter whether you'd seen something in a shop front or on television, in advertising, on film, in the public space. You just had one place to go to let people know that was unacceptable. And that it would be easier for parents to express their views to businesses about goods and services. And my final recommendation, uh, and, and this is crucial, I think, when you go away from here today, is to say that I was quite happy to spend six months of my life working with a team, researching and putting together a government report. What I didn't want was the government to take that report and say thank you very much and place it on the shelf and do nothing with it. And so what I recommended was that we gave everybody a maximum of 18 months to make the changes necessary. When I presented my recommendations to the British <laughs> Prime Minister, he said, I accept all of your presentations, all of your recommendations, except one, the last one. And I thought, here we are, this is typical government reaction, they'll not do anything with it. And he said, no, it's too long. We should give people six months to make the first set of changes, and then you and I will call them here to Downing Street to explain what they've done. And then we'll do the same in another six months, and then you can do a final review for them. I have to tell you, that has been a massive 
massive help in getting things done. It's made an enormous difference to have the support of the Prime Minister in doing this. And not once, not once, has he ever said, this is the Conservative position. Not once has anyone, uh, the Children's and Families Minister, who is a Liberal Democrat, said, this is the Liberal Democrat position. He has talked solely about being a father, or his ministers have talked about being a parent or a mother. And actually, it took out the whole party political aspect of this and has made change that much easier. Because actually, we have a generation of politicians that themselves have young children and they are worried about the future for their children. So, um, where do we get to? What's happened? It's now exactly 18 months since I published, or just a little over 18 months. Out of those 14 recommendations, nine have been fully implemented, absolutely fully implemented. A new code for outdoor advertising was introduced within a month of us issuing the report. They had gone to uh, several thousand parents and talked about the acceptability of advertising like this. This is a bus side advert from 2010. Uh, many, many parents very unhappy about that advertising on buses. This year in November, in November Marks & Spencer's, a well-known British retailer, uh, put this on bus side. I apologise for the imagery because one of my team shot this as a bus when past them, so it's a, a little blurred. But this campaign started to run. It had only run a day when the Advertising Standards Authority stepped in and said, withdraw it, it's too sexualized, withdraw it. This um, ad is the coat of fanning for Lola perfume. Um, the brief to the agency was to make you just 17 or 16 at the time. They said, make her look 14 by dressing her in children's clothing and place the bottle between her legs. That appeared and again was withdrawn after a day. The way the regulation system works in the UK is that you have to clear television advertising in advance of transmission. Um, public space advertising is always um, regulated after it has appeared. They don't pre-clear it. So Lola Perfume was withdrawn. Uh, Unilever, one of our biggest companies, um, has this ad for Lynx toiletries. Uh, which runs with the phrase, the cleaner you are, the dirtier you get. Um, this was intended to be a £1.6 million advertising campaign. It fell after day three. So massive changes already in place there. The second is this, that 90% um, of the retailers that sell clothing to pro uh, products clothing to children um, produce one month after we published the review a new code of practicing practice of what was acceptable to sell. And overnight, the discipline of the retail system meant that thongs for six-year-old girls, uh, padded bras for six-year-olds under the bralettes that, that, that Elaine talked about from Bratz Dolls, disappeared from our shelves. And you, we have not had a single complaint in the last year and a half of any inappropriate clothing offered to children. Um, the Advertising Association created a children's panel where they were interviewing children about the pressures that are on them. And as a, co as, a co uh, as a consequence of that, they agreed that we should have a consistent definition of childhood. And that was that it, 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 it came up to the age of 16. And peer-to-peer -peer and brand ambassador advertising have all been banned in the UK. You cannot buy space now to enable you to do that sort of advertising. Um, we launched a, a website called Parentport. Um, Parentport, you can see the image of it there on the screen. Um, it, it's an online portal. You click in the center where it says complain, and immediately it starts to ask you what it is you're complaining about. Um, and it, it doesn't really matter. You don't need to find the right way to complain. The website will do it for you. Um, when, uh, when I talked to uh, the Prime Minister about this, um, he said, well, is this something government should do? And I said, no, because if it is, if it's like any other government computer project, it will run five years before it actually gets launched and it'll run massively over budget and you haven't got any money either. So let's do it through the regulators. And actually the regulators found the money 
It was put up and launched within two months of the review being published. It now accounts for over 50% of all uh, complaints made about uh, these issues, whether it's cinema, uh, a film in the cinema, watershed and so on. More than half of our parents do it. It receives about 40,000 hits a week. Not necessarily um, people wanting to make complaints, but actually parents asking for help. And it's a part of giving them confidence and it enables them to express their views. Um, the, the next one is um, internet filters, putting parental controls. We've managed to get um, active choice or family friendly parental controls put in. So if you buy a new laptop now, and you, you, the typical purchase pattern for someone buying a laptop, for example, is that the parents go to the store with the young person, they choose the item together, parent pays for it with a credit card, they bring it home and then hand it to the child to set up. Now, at the moment, the way it now works is, as soon as you start to set it up, it says, um, do you want to turn on a virus checker? And, and the, the little button is already pre-ticked, so you click on yes. Then it comes up and it says, is there anyone in the house who will, or who will use this equipment who's under the age of 18? Now, what we found was, most children or young people who are setting it up will click no, because they know that that's gonna then take you into the suite of parental controls. So the, the system responds by saying, thank you for that. Will you now enter your four digit code from the credit card receipt that you paid with? So you then have to go and ask mum and dad for that four digit code, which provokes mum and dad saying, why do you want the credit card again? So they come back and see what you're saying no to. Mum and dad will often then say, yes, there is someone under the age of 18. It then goes through a suite of questions that it asks you. So for example, it may, and typically this is what we found, is parents are very concerned about eating disorder websites, sites that encourage bulimia and anorexia. They're concerned about suicide encouragement sites. They're concerned about uh, violence sites, and they are certainly concerned about pornography. So it gives you all of those uh, options to do. Uh, one of those, uh, um, providers, Talk Talk, actually also has a thing called homework time, where you as a parent can set up the time that you don't mind your child using the internet, but you don't want them to spend all their time on social networking sites. So you set up a period when the child is supposed to be working on their homework, and it blocks you from social networking sites. Parents love that one. Children don't. Um, what we haven't made a good enough progress on is having an effective age verification system. An age verification would make an enormous difference. Uh, roughly 56% uh, of children between the ages of 8 and 13 have a social networking presence. Every social networking site has a minimum age of 13. What that means is that children lie about their age, often with the complicity of their parents. But if they lie about their age, they may will receive very inappropriate advertising and imagery aimed at them. So for example, if you are eight when you sign up and you're, you should have been 13, the machine assumes you're 13. So actually five years time, the machine now assumes you're 18, but in reality you're only 13. Many young people on their sites will start talking about boyfriends or girlfriends at that stage. All of that is picked up by the keywords and starts to pump back at you heavily sexualized imagery or advertising for things like Viagra. Um, all sorts of things that are there. So we do need to get uh, proper age verification systems in place. We've got new um, active watershed guidelines um, so that uh, the, the, the program I talked to you about, the X Factor final, would not be allowed to be shown prior to nine o'clock. And then we've got four recommendations which have been partly implemented. Um, we've created a schools engagement program and parent packs to give confidence to the children. That pre the one I showed you on, that, that one was produced and paid for by the advertising industry. Uh, this one is paid for ourselves as a charity. We produce this. We, uh, we have about 10,000 parents who come uh, to our parenting groups during any one year. And so far, I think we've distributed about 50,000 of these, this uh, thing, which is about managing 
of the commercial world as a family and, and, and well, the, the commercial world and the sectionized world as a family to give parents confidence. Latsmax, um, I've, I've put as being partly successful. The main retailers have, uh, have moved these, but we still have an issue with small stores where we need to actually engage with smaller stores about how you get them to implement the new recommended displays which place magazines up with pornography. And one of the things we found, and I think this is interesting for you as, as people who might be actively involved in that, I found that our members, we have about 100,000 members in the UK and we wanted to get them actively going into stores and asking people to change the displays around. And many of them were too nervous to do so. They felt that they would encounter the wrath of the uh, store owner. So we gave them a downloadable layout form and uh, asked them to put it on a clipboard and, uh, and go into the store and draw out where the products were being displayed. Because we knew that the store owner would then come and say, what do you think you're doing? And then we put a little paragraph about how they should display magazines to say, so they overcame uh, their concern about that. So far, and we've been running a campaign now for about two months, we've had about 7,000 of them <coughs> send in uh, their forms that they've done. And many, many places they've said the people have changed the display. But it's not fully there yet. Um, it, two others that are, again, partly implemented is annual reports from regulators, largely because it's too quick, and um, quality assurance that actually media uh, and commercial literacy resources actually work for children. We need to check that through. And then there is one recommendation where we've really struggled, and that's about music videos. Um, the government have agreed that there should be a change to this, but we are really struggling with the online industry, which is how most children access uh, music videos. And it's a problem which goes far greater than just the UK. We recognise that we need to speak to uh, global players here, uh, the people who own the platforms on which most music is done. But I'm completely hopeful that we will resolve this in a matter of, of months. So what next? Well, as I've said about music videos, there's a need for international agreement, especially on web-based sites. We need to get age verification properly. And then we need to check on implementation, which I, I was so interested to hear about your, your cause and some of the things you've been doing about attending shareholders meetings. That one had passed me by, but I should be picking up and, and, and seeing how we can do some of similar things like that. Um, and we need to give confidence to parents. Um, that this is the key thing about still building up confidence with parents, that they engage in this topic with their children, that they point out some of the risks that children face. It's strange that none of us who have children would ever allow them out into the streets without teaching them the basic elements of road safety. And yet somehow we're prepared to let our children loose in the virtual world with all of the exposures that they encounter there. Because frankly it is the internet that I'm most concerned about now. Um, because I think the exposure of children to very hardcore pornography within three clicks of going online has to be of concern to us. One of the groups that I chose to interview uh, during this was teachers in schools, particularly head teachers, who talked to me about the pernicious uh, influence that pornography had on both bo boys and girls. In boys, in terms of what it set them up to expect in, and how to manage a relationship. And anyone who thinks that pornography ever shows the nature of real human relationship is sadly mistaken. And girls who believe that in order to be acceptable, they somehow need to perform like a porn star. It does really concern me that we need to win that battle with parents. And they need to overcome their concern about technology. And we need to give children and young people confidence. Um, we could put all the filters in the world onto machinery, and there will always be ways of getting around them and, and uh, people being exposed to things that we don't want to do. The, one th the best filter is the filter that's between our ears and it's built of building up confident, uh, confident and uh, emotionally resilient children and young people. And if we do that, I, I would urge you to go away from here and say you can make changes. You can create an environment where children can be children. Um, don't be downhearted by it. You need to win over 
your politicians and your industry and your parents, and then you'll win the children over. Um, one just word about uh, industry. I found that actually there was no one that I encountered in industry who, when it was pointed out to them, that perhaps some of the things that we sold to children uh, were less than acceptable. There was no one who fundamentally disagreed with them. I found that the average buyer of children's clothing in a British retailer was a woman between 35 and 45 who had children of her own. And it was very interesting to ask, would you allow your child to wear that item? And many of them said no. And you said, well, why is it okay to sell it to people? And they said, well, we make money out of it. It's as though they'd left their ethics at the door. Trying to encourage them to bring their ethics into the workplace can work, and indeed has worked. And the idea that if they don't comply with that, you resort to regulation, I think is mistaken. My feeling is if they don't comply, you resort to brand embarrassment. No one wants to see millions of pounds wiped off their share prices by, seeing, by be, being seen to peddle things that are inappropriate for children. And so, uh, as I say, thank you for listening to me. I, I wish you Godspeed with all that you're trying to do in protecting the children in this country. Thank you.